This is the Menopause Movement Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Michelle Gordon. Hey, what's up, Menopod? Hey, remember that seven-mile race in Cape Cod I was talking about? I spent a lot of time training for it, but I, I couldn't do it. My wife's a doctor, and she's trained in internal medicine, does primary care, including hospital care. That means COVID. And COVID's in its fourth wave right now, and the new variants are an unknown. So I asked her, what would you tell me if I were your patient? Now, mind you, this was a scaled back version of the race and only 8,000 people were going to run. It's usually over 11,000. And she said it's too risky. So I was gutted and I didn't even run the seven miles at home. I sat on my couch and ate too much and watched too much TV. And plus, Alex is still at home because we didn't go up to the race. But I bounced back and I got back out there and ran just for fun. And I had to snap out of my temporary funk and get back on the proverbial horse. And I'm not sure what my next event will be, but I'm definitely trying to be better than yesterday every single day. And getting better at anything requires awareness, awareness of my thoughts and the feelings they cause and the subsequent actions that I drive with them. And you know, when it comes to menopause in life, the only constant is change. And what I'm here to tell you is that change is possible but it won't happen overnight. The first step to making a change is making the decision to change. And then we have to back that up with action. And that's the big challenge. How do we take any action? And even more importantly, what actions should we take? So the menopause movement is here to help you with all of that. Menopause can be a time of misery, or it can be a time of unapologetic action toward creating a life we love. I woke up in the middle of my menopause journey, hating myself, my body, and the life I had created. I didn't know what to do, so I went on a quest to find out how to make change happen. And the result was the menopause movement and this podcast. The menopause movement has one purpose, to help end the suffering caused by menopause through transformational education and coaching. And we want to help you too. So head on over to menopausemovement.com. Take the quiz there. And not only will you discover your type, but we'll also tailor some offerings to help you take back your life from menopause. Getting back into the driver's seat of my life was the first step I took to overcome the changes I experienced with menopause. But I did it alone, and it was lonely. The menopause movement has created a community of women who are unapologetically deciding to become their best selves one small action at a time. And you can too. Join our community and start to create a life you love. Today, we are talking all things vagina and pelvic floor with physical therapist Isa Herrera. Isa is a licensed physical therapist as well as an expert in integrated pelvic floor therapies. She developed her expertise in diagnosing and treating pelvic pain, leaking, and prolapse by helping over 14,000 women since 2005 at her New York City Healing Center Renew PT. Isa pioneered the use of integrated modalities like Maya Massage, cold laser therapy, sound healing, and Andean energy techniques with evidence-based physical therapy in ways that had never been done before. She's also the author of five books on the topics of pelvic floor dysfunction and pain, including the newly released international bestseller, Female Pelvic Alchemy. Issa's new online school brings all of her expertise to a global audience, incorporating exercises, self-care techniques, and integrative tools to maximize female healing and professional training. After suffering from pelvic floor dysfunction herself, after her uh, daughter was born, Issa has made it her life's mission to help 1 million women overcome pelvic floor dysfunction. During the podcast, we discuss the trauma of childbirth and Issa's path to pelvic pain relief, how the medical profession doesn't really understand the female pelvic floor, France versus the USA in postpartum pelvic floor rehabilitation, shame and speaking up, especially about female issues. Is there a magic pill to fix the pelvic floor? What happens with prolapse and leakage? The body is a map to health. What to do to improve your libido and vaginal dryness? the pelvic floor and constipation, and state of the end to find out how sexual trauma can be stored in the pelvic floor. At the end of the episode, visit menopausemovement.com forward slash podcast, where you can find the show notes plus the links to the books and resources mentioned in the episode. 
And if you enjoyed this episode, be sure to leave a written review, like, and subscribe on YouTube and subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. So you're always the first to know when each episode is released. Now, who should we have on the podcast? I really want to hear from you. And what can we do to make it better? Let me know by sending me a DM, Instagram at Dr. Michelle Gordon, or on Facebook also at Dr. Michelle Gordon. And when you send me a DM, you'd actually get me. I answer all my own DMs. Uh, you can send me an email, Dr. Gordon at menopausemovement.com, D-R-G-O-R-D-O-N. And thanks again for being a part of the menopause movement. Now let's get to Isa. So Issa, welcome to the Menopause Movement Podcast, and thanks for making the time to come and join us. You have a product and a, and a world that is so you know interesting to women in menopause, especially any woman who's had a baby. And so why don't you just tell us a little bit about you know who you are and where you're from and who you serve and, and, and how it is that you've come from serving one-on-one -on -one to one-to-many. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me on your podcast. I am super excited to be here and to share whatever I can with your community. Yeah. And, you know, life can throw you a curveball. And sometimes you can either the, that curveball can either hold you down or it is the, the catalyst to bring you forth into a new mission. And I always say that the day that my daughter was born was the day that my purpose was born as well. And until then... I was a physical therapist working in, in an orthopedic setting. I never thought once about my pelvic floor. I never, I didn't even know what the pelvic floor was. <laughs> I didn't even care about it until I had my baby and I had a tremendous amount of trauma and I had to find a way to heal myself. And I kept, you know, going, uh, the regular, what I call the Dr. Rose show, going from one physician to another physician to another physician, trying to find answers. And really no one had answers for me. Mm. And a lot of doctors, unfortunately, are not really super educated in this particular body part. So they kept telling me to go do more Kegels and I'm a good patient, you know, and I went and I did more Kegels and I ended up with more pain mm. and I ended up with more leaking. I ended up with more dysfunction. And so I knew that I had to apply the knowledge that I already knew about the body to this particular sacred anatomy, which, by the way, I never knew anything about it because my mother didn't even discuss this topic with right. me so it was really interesting it was a whole education it was like getting a phd on vagina right and it was amazing because until then we many of us you know especially with the way i grew up you know so much shame so much silence around um things that can go wrong with our with our lady parts and when i realized that i wasn't alone that there are millions and millions of women just like me out there suffering in silence i knew that i had to make a change i knew that i needed to change from being a personal trainer orthopedic pt and i became a pelvic floor specialist now this is way back when no one knew what a pelvic floor specialist was and many people would ask me is this even legal you know <laughs> wow. and I was like wow well, there's a lot of ignorance out there and I said of course it's part of the branch of therapy that we can do and so I opened up a practice on Madison Avenue and, and you know the universe would, had my back and everything went as it should very successful very lucrative um helped thousands and thousands and thousands of women and I knew that this was my life's mission and I've dedicated my, my, my whole life to doing that. And I was doing one-on-one. -on -one. I had a bunch of physical therapists working for me. And then in, in 2016, I came up, uh, I, I came down with, with Lyme disease and I almost died. And I was on my deathbed and, you know, some, there's nothing like, like experiencing you, yourself very close to the brink of death to have complete clarity about what it is that you need to do. And I said, I know. I need to bring this message more global. I want to bring it to the millions of women, right? So my mission is to help 1 million women heal from pelvic floor dysfunction. So I closed my practice, even though everybody told me I was nuts to do that. What are you doing? Why would you step away from this? But I knew that I wasn't physically strong for, to do that particular kind of therapy anymore. Very high stress, a lot of management. Uh, it was a lot to be on Madison Avenue. And I said, everybody was doing this online thing. So I was divinely guided into going from one to one to one to many, but it happened because of my experience with this Lyme disease. And, and of course, now I'm better and everything heals. But wow, what a trip that was, right? Postpartum to 
having successful therapy center to almost dying to going online. And so here, here you have me. This yeah. is what brings well, me to I the mean, present. And, and you think about like global events even over the last five years and the fact that you were already online just made it easier for you when everything shut down because of COVID. And it's so true. And I'm glad that you bring that up because when I went online, everybody was saying, well, how can you teach this online? Women cannot learn this therapy online. They have to be in person. They were telling me, Isa, this is not even right. What are you doing? They called me all kinds of names, all kinds of things, you know, really backlash from the medical community. And now they see me as a visionary. And it's like, yeah, it's like, you know, you told me I was a crook. Now I'm a visionary. You know, It's your overnight success story after, you know, working your ass off for it for all that time. So true. Um, but, but you said a couple of things. And I think I think we need to circle back to one of them was that, you know, the suffering in silence and the fact that doctors uh, don't understand female anatomy. And I think that gives us an opportunity to talk for a minute about menopause and how doctors don't get any education in menopause at all, just like doctors don't get any education in nutrition. Uh, at least in America. I don't know about other countries. Uh, I am a you know board certified surgeon in uh, New York and Texas. And so I, I, and I went to medical school in California. So I can say that, you know, I didn't get any training in that. I did get some training in the anatomy of the pelvic floor and uh, of course the, the vaginal anatomy, but it was not stressed as much as the male anatomy, which is very interesting. And there was no discussion about the trauma of childbirth. And after having a baby myself in 1993, and you know, I had a big episiotomy, and I and and I don't leak. I mean, I'm I'm actually pretty lucky. Everything came back together pretty well for me. I don't have pain. But in talking to my friends in France, right, that there's just such a different culture about the female anatomy and, and what to do after a baby. And in France, they like they have a device that they give women and they teach women how to use it afterwards to get their musculature back. And so can, maybe you could just talk for a minute about the difference between, I mean, are, you're aware of that, obviously, right? Between oh, obviously. Between France. Have, yeah. 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 Obviously, yeah. So, yeah. so the difference between, you know, what it's like to even have a baby and do, you know, sexual rejuvenation in France versus America. I'm glad that you bring that up because when I had my practice in Madison Avenue, the French woman be knocking on my door one week out. I need yeah. my perineal re-education. Yeah. And I was like, wow, you know, you need to wait six weeks because, you know, in this country we wait six weeks until the woman is completely healed before you can get the therapy. And I really was so in awe of the women, the French women in particular, because in that country, women get pelvic floor re-education, pelvic floor therapy, and the government pays for it. Mm -hmm. In this country, you have your baby, you have your cesarean, you're lucky if you get a, a one checkup. And then you're on your own. They ask you what kind of birth control you want, and they send you home. And the majority of women are suffering. They get perineal tears, they get episiotomies, they get cesareans, they'll have some kind of, they can even have a pubic bone separation, they can break their coccyx. There's so much obstetrical trauma. And when I have my center in New York City, and in my online programs as well, we help women recover from that by teaching them how to do it on their own, right? For me, there's no reason why a woman needs to outsource that care, what we need to do is go inward and understand our anatomy and listen to the messages of our bodies, right? So the French women were always listening to the messages of their body. They were very in tune. They weren't ashamed. They wanted to fix the problem right away. The American women that came to me, um, they were like, I can't tell anybody about this. This is so embarrassing. Um, I have pain. I'm leaking. I have a prolapse. I don't want to even tell my girlfriends about it. And I feel like there were two different kinds of faces to the problem. One, one was, yes, I'm here. I need the education. I need to rebuild. And the other one was shrouded in shame. And it has a lot to do with the culture that we live in in America. Yeah, for sure. Right? Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, you think about it, we come from a puritanical roots, uh, sex is dirty and evil, but let's have it anyway, right? <laughs> Everyone so wants to have sex. And then we have this whole culture of if a girl gets pregnant, it's her fault. And she has to deal with the shame of that. And that it has nothing to do with the guy, the guy's just virile. And, and then, you know, on top of that, there's all of the, the medical research that until the 2000s was done on men. Yeah. And so there was no, it, it, and this is, this is worldwide. I mean, except for maybe France. And, and then, you know, one, one of the things I talk about a lot here at the menopause movement is how we, 
have so much shame around our periods. Like we wait, 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 we're going to be adults. We're going to be adults. And then we get our periods and we have, because we're bleeding and it's blood and it's gross. It's like, oh, we can't talk about that. Mm -hmm. And so then we, then we don't talk about what, what we're going through in menopause. And, you know, even after childbirth, I mean, all the, all the changes we just have to suffer with. I mean, when I, I did this TV show a few years ago and one of the ladies was a French woman who had re had moved from, from, from France to Santa Barbara. And she talked about how she leaked all the time. She couldn't run because she would just pee her pants. And I was like, well, there's gotta be a better way. And so here you are. And I'm going to make sure that I send her a text with this, with this <laughs> podcast, because, you know, even somebody who's had a baby, maybe 30 years ago, you ha you can help them. Right. Oh, absolutely. And the, and the crazy thing is that when you, when women hit menopause, I had my baby at 41 and I went into menopause at 41 and a half. Wow. It was the double whammy postpartum and menopause at the same time. Now I lost my period. Nobody knew why it's still a mystery why that would happen. And we, we have some, but what I've discovered is that because of the decline of the hormones, we need to have stronger pelvic floors so that we're not suffering from vaginal dryness. So we're not suffering from leaking and weakness that can also lead to prolapse. So we have a lot of women in the menopausal stage not knowing what to do to care for the sacred anatomy, maybe never learned in their lives, thinking that they had a baby 30 years ago and it makes no difference to what's happening now. And I can say 100% that if you had a baby 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago, it doesn't matter. There's still repercussions. The body holds the memory. Yeah. And unless we go in there and we stir it up and we change the memory by doing some intravaginal massaging, some Kegels, reverse Kegels, whatever the case may be, we always have that. Mm -hmm. And then we become weaker because so many of us become also atrophied in when we're in menopause, we lose bone density, right? So all these things are happening simultaneously. And I believe that all these things can be helped if you have a very strong pelvic floor. So it trickles out to sure. the spine, it trickles out to the hips. And if you're doing the right workout, then you're also increasing bone density, but you're also being um, rejuvenated from the inside out. So a lot of women right now fall prey into all these technologies. You name it, the Mona Lisa. I mean, there's there's a thousand ways to rejuvenate the, your vagina. The jade this egg. <laughs> yeah. Well, I like the jade egg. The jade egg is all fine. I use it for more educational purposes. But yeah. what I find is that we want that magical pill. We want that surgery. We want the vaginal rejuvenation. We want the thermi, whatever the case may be. But we forget that the answers are already within us and we have to do the work. And there's no such thing as getting these rejuvenation procedures and then not working on your body. It is not the be all to end all, right? But we've been brainwashed by yeah. the media, by big pharma, by, you know, even our doctors to believe that healing is outside of ourselves. Come someone, please save me, please. <laughs> I mean, it's it's the whole Cinderella complexes, but it's not just that there's more to it than that because where's the profit in somebody who can heal themselves? Right. And and I like to say that America is the land of the corporation and the home of the profit. And I have nothing against profit. I think profit is awesome. But, you know, when it comes to medical care, there's no, the, the people who benefit from, you know, the pills, powders, potions, and patches are the pharmaceutical companies and the supplement companies. And it's not, it's not us because there is no, there's no magic cure for menopause. Menopause is a natural thing. And after childbirth, there's going to be some things that happen, but you can take steps to heal your pelvic floor. So let's talk about something that almost no one ever wants to talk about is um, let's talk about prolapse. Mm -hmm. when when all the parts fall out yeah so um, how, how, how do you deal with that oh my god with prolapse this is the thing that happens with prolapse and i think that with this is one of the things that i'll be covering on the master class which i think is very important for women to understand women who have prolapse and who leak as well they think that they're loose that they're big right that they're weak what I find with menopause and some women who have leak and have urgency is that they have tension in the pelvic floor. And this tension is because they're trying to hold their organs up. So they're always constantly mm -hmm. gripping, right? Or they're constantly not trying to go to the bathroom. So they're always holding up so they don't have to pee on themselves. And this creates this tension that we must deal with before we can introduce a Kegel, before we can introduce 
um, exercising because we cannot, when there's tension in the pelvic floor, there's also weakness. So then you have to ask yourself the question, am I weak because I'm tense or am I weak because I'm weak and the muscles aren't, are too relaxed. But with, with prolapse, it really hurts women's activities and they feel there's nothing for them to do. So they go and they get these mesh surgeries and all these other surgeries and then they fail and they mm -hmm. have a lifetime of pain when I believe that the doctor maybe should have introduced a course of conservative therapy, right? And maybe even a pessary. And then, you know, if all else fails, but I've never had, I've never lost a patient to a surgery. So let's, let's just define pessary for the audience. So pessary is like diff like 12 different kinds. And depending on the type that you need, you need to be fitted correctly. And you put it inside and it's sort of like um, it holds your organs up in place, mm. right? When they're dropping down. So sometimes women who came to see me in the center, I treated a lot of young women marathon runners because I was treating a lot of marathon runners and a lot of the ballet uh, people. They have a lot of, believe it or not, prolapse issues. Mm. So I would treat them. And if they want to run, then they would do a pessary until the muscles caught up. So pessary is something that you will use depending on the severity of the prolapse. Of course, if it's completely out of the body, which it can be fourth degree, then you may need to use a pessary all the time. But for someone who has a first degree, second degree, third degree pessary uh, prolapse, like I do, I have a third degree prolapse of the bladder. I don't wear pessary. I fix my body, I work out, I work my core, I work my muscles, and I make sure that I'm listening to my body if I am doing something that's creating more pressure in my vagina and I feel like something's falling out, then we have to modify our behavior. We have to modify our lifestyle until the muscles can catch up, right? Mm -hmm. Or sometimes those lifestyle modifications have to be there forever. Like I don't run anymore. I used to be an avid runner, crazy runner. I believe that's how I got my prolapse, you know, and then I had the birth and the trauma and then it was exasperated. Mm -hmm. So with, with prolapse, I think a lot of women feel very hopeless. They feel like there's nowhere to turn, but I can tell you right now, as long as you're taking care of your sacred anatomy, understanding the pelvic floor, doing Kegels, reverse Kegels, and some core work, and investigating maybe if there's a trigger point inside the vagina or outside in the body, and understanding that your body is a map, right? It is this beautiful, I call it the queen's arm, it's a temple that we need to take care of, and our sacred anatomy is in the middle of everything. So the crazy thing about, about the pelvic floor is that it's influenced. It influences outward, but then everything on the outside can influence inward. Mm -hmm. It also has 17 meridian lines, which is crazy to think about, right? Mm -hmm. You think about all that energy in there. Yeah. So for me, if I'm looking at a prolapse, I want to see the posture. I want to see the hip alignment. And these are things that are easily taught. I teach this in my classes. And I also want to see if they have a diastasis recti separation, the separation of the abdominals. We want mm -hmm. to correct for that because that's a high risk for prolapse. So women with prolapse are sometimes like, I'm doomed. There's nothing that I can do. This is my life. I, it's over. I mean, listen, I've, I've heard like 15,000 stories, most of them embedded in my brain. <laughs> and what I can tell you is that there's always hope, but we got to put in the effort. We have to discover how to trust ourselves again. I think that this is an issue of not trusting our bodies and falling into this, like you said, Cinderella. Somebody come yeah. and save me. Somebody give me the kiss and wake me up. Somebody take me away from this. But the truth is that the person on the white horse, the knight in shining armor, is really you. Yeah. And in it, this story, definitely. yeah, you save yourself. Yeah. Right? You save yourself. And we forget that because I was never taught that as a, as a girl. Yeah. My mother was always like, marry well, <laughs> don't make too many waves, you know? You yeah, know? yeah. I mean, I think, I think there's a couple things, uh, you know, I, I just, I just wrapped up a, a free course and one of the, one of the women in the course said, you know, can you point me to some pelvic, you know, some free pelvic, pelvic floor help? And I said, well, watch your email. We're going to be sending some stuff because, you know, you're coming up with a really great class that's, that's happening soon. And, and if you want to, join that. We're going to send some emails and we're also going to hook you up in the show notes for that. But the other thing I said to her was, I said, you know, sometimes you got to invest in yourself mm -hmm. to get the best, because something I've learned through not only, not only, you know, this, this business, the menopause movement, but when I was running my surgical practice that the people who actually came in and paid their copays, they were, they were much more invested in their health than the people who didn't have to pay anything. 
Mm-hmm. And and it's it's just really funny because when you pay for something, you're going to pay more attention, you know. And so, well, I know in your in your master classes and and in your content that you don't charge for, it's really good. The point I'm trying to make here is that you know when you pay for it, it's even better. <laughs> No, I believe that. You know, yeah. that I'm glad that you mentioned that because it's such a great point that you bring up. When I was in my physical therapy practice, we were in network for about a year and a half. I noticed a trend of women not being really invested in their therapy. So I went completely cash based. Yeah. And what was really interesting was that the women would get better faster, right? Because yeah. my deal was, let me get you better faster. I don't want to hold you prison in my practice forever and ever, like so many other physical therapists come to see me two to three times a week for the rest of your life. My thing was six sessions in and out. I think that's why I was so super successful. And in those six sessions, I taught you what to do for yourself, not only me, but my entire team who I trained. Yeah. And then I took that entire process and put it into an online program so women can awaken within them their own healer, their own inner doctor. Because it is really bad when you go see a practitioner and the practitioner suffers from, let me save you, and they do everything for you and you're not educated and you're right back where you started from and you invested all this money and you don't even know how to care for yourself. And yeah. you don't know anything about your body. Yeah, I mean, this is so this is so good because it's it's so important that we start to understand that everything we need is inside of us. And yeah, you know, sometimes we do need surgeons and sometimes we do need, you know, medicine. I'm not, I'm not dissing medicine, but when it comes to female health in particular, medicine has failed women over and over and over. And you kind of look at the state of the world and how in parts of the world, females are just pushed down and pushed down. It's almost like, you know, women are treated worse than dogs for, you know, whatever reason. I mean, there's, there's a lot of reasons for the patriarchy. I, this is not the platform to talk about it. <laughs> but I think that, you know, we're, we're in America, you know, your audience is global, but, but this is, you know, menopause movements in America. I'm in New York, you're in New York. And what we want to do is, you know, really realize that there's stuff we can do. We don't have to live with this pain. We don't have to live with, with uh, the, the leakage and all of these things. And, and before you go to something radical as surgery, there's a lot you can do before that. And I mean, I, I'm a surgeon, right? I understand we heal with steel. And <laughs> I mean, that's, that's what surgeons, thing. yeah, that's what surgeons do. Surgeons heal with steel, but there, there's a lot you can do. Surgery is always the last resort, always. So uh, for, for women who are in menopause, let's, let's talk specifically about a couple of things that we see over and over and over. One of the big things is loss of libido. How can women who are in menopause start to, you know, I mean, I know that there's a big psychological component that comes with sex drive. And, and so we address that we have, we have a sexual desire course, and we have a, you know, course about connection, but, but physically, what, what is something that, that I could start right now if I were having trouble? I think the main thing is to move the pelvis. It's such a great question. I think that too many of us don't move and too many of us don't even look at our pelvic floor, don't even look or even massage our vaginas. So I think the first thing is figure eights, circles, salsa dancing, a little bit of Zumba. We have to move the energy. What I find in menopause is that the energy in the pelvis becomes stagnant. Mm. And there's no microcirculation to the pelvis because the, the pelvic floor is either very weak very tight or combination thereof. So in order to increase this flow into the pelvis, we have to juice it up and we juice it up through simple movement, figure eights, hip circles. And then we have to understand that doing Kegels alone is not going to be the be all to end all that we have to understand the majority of women don't do Kegels correctly. I'll be covering this in great detail, but for now, understand that if you want to get more energy into the pelvis, you want to bring more libido into it, we have to create a pelvic floor that's receptive, that's able to receive. So many of us are in a state of fear, we're locked down, we're super tight, and we don't even know it. We don't even know it. So, So some gentle movement, definitely deep breathing, I call vaginal breathing, breathing into the vagina so that we can open, right? Because if we want to have beautiful sensation we want to have amazing orgasms we want to have deep connections that's not going to happen if you're like this you have to 
be able to open and let go. But so many of us have been brainwashed by the media and Cosmo magazine to do this. And that if you can lift a coconut with your vagina, that's going to be like the thing to pleasure. And it's actually the opposite. It would decrease your sensation. It would decrease your orgasm, orgasmic mm -hmm. power. And it's going to make you tighter and bring you out of balance. So you lose that flexibility. The pelvic floor has to move with your breath and it moves with every activity that you do. It naturally contracts and relaxes mm. and it follows the rhythm of the diaphragm. So if you're not even breathing correctly, if you're not even doing that, that alone can shut you off from the power of your vagina, right? So it's so funny because every time you say vagina, I'm like, Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> I, that I do it on purpose. I know, now. no, I think it's great. <laughs> and, and because, well, the, the problem is, is that we, we just, it's like, like penis isn't a word that we consider to be, you know, it's just penis, right? Yeah. But when it comes to like female stuff, it's like vagina. Oh, that's not, you know, and, and for me, I know that's like a function of, of patriarchy and, and all the things that I've had to unlearn. Uh, as an adult, you know, from my childhood. So we're, we're able to start to maybe move our bodies and maybe take a salsa class and kind of find our sexy. And that's awesome. So what would you say to someone who is having problems with vaginal dryness? With vaginal dryness, sometimes it has to do with the constriction of the pelvic floor. So it's not just because we lose estrogen, right? So maybe sometimes a little estriodial will go, uh, uh, estriol will go a long way. But we also have to remember that the pelvic floor responds to the food that we eat. So we want to keep that pH in the vagina acidic, sarapus, right? The way we can do that is through making sure that our internal body is alkaline, but the vaginal tissue is acidic. All right. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yeah. I have to, no, <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I, I, I really have a hard time with anyone who thinks that the body is going to be more alkaline. Now there might be things you can do to help the, the pH of the vagina with foods, but there is a 0 0.5 pH window that our bodies stay in. And, yeah. and, that, and that's just, you know, so for, for us to be alkaline, we, I mean, there are parts of our bodies that have to be super acidic, like the, like the stomach. And this is just from a science perspective. So I have a yeah. real hard time with people who say that you have to keep the body alkaline, uh, because well, from I'm a science talking, perspective, yeah. it's, it, I mean, if you're, if you're, if your pH goes down one point, then you're <laughs> breathing like this because you're trying to, to, to blow off the CO2 or whatever. And so there's some science that we have to follow here. And that's what, that's one of them that I just, I really have a hard time with anyone who says you have to keep your body alkaline. And I'm so talking I just, about yeah. I'm talking about vaginal, vaginal okay. only. Fifteen thousand women underneath my belt, and I'm telling you, if you're eating processed food, if you do the car, if you, if you don't use food as medicine, okay, because that's what food is. Yes. Then it's going to dry you up. If you eat, consume a lot of sugar, you're going to get yeast. I mean, this is all correlated. If your microbiome yeah. is off, it's going to have a deep effect on the vaginal microbiome. So for me, food is medicine. And when you want to heal, you have to heal with what you're putting in your body first. So if you're doing pelvic floor physical therapist, but then therapy, but then you're eating a bunch of sugar, processed foods, not drinking enough water, it's going to have an effect on dryness. Right. Well, that, that I agree that. with. Yeah. Yeah. I've um, seen that over so, and over again. So yeah, I, we yeah, talk, we spend a sure. lot of time, we spend a lot of time talking about nutrition and how mm -hmm. seed oils and sugar are probably the, the things that it's like the number one thing we can, we can change in our diet. It's easy to change uh, from a, you know, from a, from a psychological, well, maybe, maybe not that uh, from a, from a perspective of, of behavior, like, like I know I'm doing this, so let me change it. So it's a simple idea, but it's hard to put it into practice. Oh, it's of, so hard. You know, I've broken like up with chocolate many, many times, many, many times I've broken <laughs> up with chocolate, but I'm going to tell you as someone who suffered from pelvic floor dysfunction mm. for many years and I'm, re you know, I'm pretty healed now, but I always have my moments. If I'm not watching what I'm eating and I eat a lot of sugar and I have a beer, it goes right to my vagina. That doesn't surprise me. I mean, I yeah. feel, you know, I, every six months or so, I'll have a couple of beers and a drink. And, and I don't drink usually because I, I exercise a lot. And, and so it kind of interferes with that. And, and I think alcohol also interferes with my spiritual connection. And so I don't, mm -hmm. I try to stay away from it. But uh, just, just a couple of days ago, I, I, I drank and I just didn't, you know, every time I drink, I'm like, why do I do this? It doesn't feel good, yeah. you know? And so it does, it, I don't, I don't notice it in my vagina, but maybe I'll get a hemorrhoid. 
you know, or something. Oh, so, okay. That's, that's you know, interesting. Things like that happen, you know, just from, from making poor food, food choices. And I mean, I'm a cyclist too. So, and cyclists have hemorrhoids. Anyway. Oh yeah. Yeah. Of yeah. course. Yeah. <laughs> and but, a lot of, a lot of pressure on the pelvis in cycling as well. Due to yeah. Cyclists. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, um, so when it comes to, so, so let's just to go back to the vet, let's close the loop on the vaginal dryness. So, uh, staying away from fast food, eating whole real foods, uh, trying to cut off sugar. Chocolate's probably okay if you have like 83% or higher. Yeah. And you, and you limit the amount, right? I mean, yeah, I think so. We got to live. Probably. Yeah. Right. I, I mean, you know, you can't say that you could never eat chocolate again. I mean, the, the, the chocolate is really, really good, but you think about how we evolved and we would only eat honey during certain times of the year when we could find the bees and go get the hives and, and, and that sort of thing. Right. And, and now it's just so available all the time. Our pancreas never gets a rest. So I wanted to shift gears and talk for a minute about sexual trauma and how, how you manage women with sexual trauma. Because I think in America, it's it's probably closer to one in two women have had some form of sexual trauma, even though the st- statistics will say one in four. It's probably closer to one in two. Yeah, I mean, listen, I had a question once that someone asked me, "How many of the women in your practice and on your online programs have been had some sort of adverse sexual um, experience?" And I would say, "Oh, about ninety nine percent of them. It's rampant. Yeah, and it's, it's also it's... been correlated to dyspareunia, vulvodynia." Uh-huh. All right, right because let's, attention let's use lay health. terms here. Dyspareunia, yeah, so it's painful to sex. Painful sex and vulvodynia yeah. is painful in the vulva. can be with touch or without touch. And right. what happens is that when you start to heal this body part, and by the way, the women who join my program, sometimes they can't do any internal work because there's too much trauma, psychological trauma, sexual trauma. Yeah. So I did a whole module on how to work on the pelvic floor externally. Mm. And I did that, and the women who came to see me, if they're not ready to do internal or know how to test themselves internally, I had to do a whole workaround. Because what I discovered over you know 15 years is that many women are not ready. Yeah. They're not ready to even look at themselves down there. So I would have to start like on the belly, working on the belly, or figuring out how to align the pelvis, or start with the food, or track the bladder, until they had the courage to go inward and to do the more detailed pelvic work. So mm-hmm. the great thing about the pelvic floor, because it is influenced from everything that's happening on the outside as well, is that you can have a profound effect on the pelvic floor by simply doing foam rolling or doing trigger point work externally or even rolling the labia if you can do that. So for women who have sexual trauma, sometimes I do encourage them to be at the same time working with someone, you know, a therapist, psychotherapist, mm-hmm. analyst, There's so many different types of healers out there at the same time as they're doing their body work because the body holds the count. The body holds the memory. And I've had women um, have retrieval of memories, lost memories as I was doing the internal work. And all I would do is get, you know, I would take the finger out and I would just hold the space. And the same thing, if you have something coming up, well, we're going to have to deal with that. It cannot be in the body anymore. So then how do you deal with that? You just basically go back to the breathing, go back to mindfulness, go back Mm -hmm. to meditation, which I teach in the programs, and go back to understanding that it's better for this thing to come up now than to be stuck in your body and subconsciously influencing your relationships, your love relationships, your relationships with your kids. So I always encourage everyone, if they can, to see a sex therapist as well, if it's affecting that, but a sex therapist, a trained sex therapist, not a psychoanalyst yeah. um, as well. So it really depends on what you need. But honestly, most of the women who who, who have undergone these kind of uh, reactions who are in, the, in these experiences also typically will work with somebody as well. They, yeah, they, no, they have a team. They have a team. Yeah, yeah that, so that's... Alone. That's really important to to know because when when you're able to start to bring up memories that, that the body's holding on to, I mean those those traumas from from childhood that you may not even remember, they they affect everything because that's subconscious programming, yeah. and and it's so important for us as the adult to go back and parent the child or that or the, even the 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 younger adult that was harmed, and we have to we have to. St- you know, deal with that on the psychological level. And it's, it, it can be very hard. Uh, there's a couple books that, that I think 
we can recommend here Bessel van de Kamp, which is the body keeps the score is mm -hmm. a good one. And then um, my friend Deirdre Fay, she was on the podcast not too long ago, and she wrote a book called Becoming Safely Embodied. She used to work in Bessel's lab. And so she's she's got a book. So those are a couple of books that we can recommend if you're if you're somebody who's dealing with sexual trauma or even, you know, any trauma. It isn't just sexual trauma. Right. I mean, we're talking about the pelvic floor today, but but, you know, if you have gone through a car accident, then, you know, your body's going to hold on to that, too. Mm hmm. Yeah. So let's talk about how the pelvic floor influences digestive health. Okay. The pelvic floor is really interesting, right? Because so many women come to see me with chronic constipation, mm. hemorrhoids, fecal incontinence, the whole thing. What I find when the pelvic floor is very tight, because in order to defecate and urinate, the pelvic floor muscle must relax completely. You want to get rid of things? You have to relax completely. Right. You Most get that women, parasympathetic, if, you know, juice is flowing. Yeah. And then you also have yeah. to release the sphincters. Yeah. In order to release the sphincters, you have to let go and you have to relax in order to get the rectum to contract and the bladder to contract. So if you can't relax, right, and your pelvic floor muscles are too tight, then you're suffering from constipation and you may have a super clean diet and you're wondering why is this happening. And it's probably because of you're either pushing with urination or defecation, which is a no-no, but your muscles can be too tight, giving you this feeling like you can't fully empty. So you mm -hmm. always feel like something's inside the bladder or you feel like your rectum, you haven't completely had a bowel movement and it's because you have to really relax and let go in order for those two things to happen. So, so it's really interesting how the pelvic floor will influence that as well. So how do you feel about the squatty potty? I like it. Yeah. I, I've got one in every bathroom in my home. Yeah, yeah, I do like it. I recommend yeah. that as one of the tools that the women get when they start the program because it puts them in, in a good position. And if you don't have a squatty potty, you can take a couple of books, right? Yeah. Wrap them up and it's put like them underneath your feet. Long, it's, yeah. 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 It's just as easy to do that too. You know, That's, especially if I'm in a hotel room, I usually try to find pillows and books in order to make that happen. Yeah, that's that's for sure. So was there anything else you were hoping to share today that we didn't get to? No, I think this interview was really, really, really very detailed. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, thanks. Really for enjoy coming myself. Out. I think that you covered everything. I don't think uh, there's anything that we didn't cover. Well, I think there's more. There's always more. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. There, there's always more. So what I'd like to do um, in the in the show notes, we're going to give you uh, everyone a link to find Isa and get registered for her masterclass and uh, kind of get get an understanding of what's happening. I mean, you know, when I started this this business, this podcast, nobody was talking about menopause and menopause is now coming up and coming mm -hmm. as a as as a topic. And you know, we're in our we've just started our third year of the podcast and I want to say that, you know, sexual female sexual health and, you know, the pelvic floor is something that we just don't talk about in America and it's time it's really time to do that. So thank you. Well, thank you for having me right. on your podcast. I really yeah. enjoyed it. I hope that everyone got tremendous value from the from the interview. And yeah. I just want to say that you are an incredible interviewer and you really oh. created the, 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 the best picture for women going through menopause to understand, you know, the details of it, because this is not, like you said, it's not spoken about. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's we're breaking the silence around that. And we, we want to, you know, my mission is to help a million women uh, create a life that they love, regardless of menopause, because we're all going to go through it if we live long enough. It's our privilege. All right. Thanks a lot, Isa. Thank you so much. I really had a wonderful time. Did you know that menopause is not a medical condition? Most doctors don't know this either. I like to say that menopause is the privilege of a long life. And to really take hold of our lives in menopause, we have to unlearn what society and the medical establishment has told us about menopause. This is why I've created this brand new course called Understanding Your Hormones and Managing Your Menopause. I want to show you how you can get on top of your menopause right now so that you can start to see it as the best time of your life. Now, this course is valued at $500 and is in the beta testing phase. And we're currently accepting applications for women to test it out for us at no charge in exchange for feedback and testimonials. But the best part is because you're a podcast listener, you can bypass the application process and go straight to the front of the line. To register right now, simply visit menopausemovement.com forward slash hormones and we can get started together right now. 
Remember, you can get started right now at no charge to you in exchange for feedback and testimonials when you go to menopausemovement.com forward slash hormones. And I'll see you inside the course. Thanks so much for being a part of the menopause movement. Thank you.